Good morning. And welcome to worship on this September day as we gather here in this place. We acknowledge that we gather on the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples. And we seek to steward this land once known as Turtle Island and to live in right relationship with all peoples, indigenous, settler, newcomer, as well as all of creation's beings. You'll notice we're doing things just a little bit differently in our order here this morning. And I'm going to get Jean to come up and offer us the life and work as well as uh, thinking about any community celebrations to let her know that we might have. I do have a quick announcement that I want to do just uh, before I forget. We found a set of keys in the parking lot. They are Chevy keys, one of the pop-up kind, the laser cut kind. We know these are not cheap, and so we have posted it all over social media and have not had anybody uh, claim these yet. If you know of anybody who lost a key, uh, fob for a Chevrolet vehicle. It does have the Chevy logo on there and it's got a dog. So I'm thinking it's somebody who walks their dog through our parking lot <laughs> um, that you may know of. So if you hear of anybody talking about that, we do have them here. We're still trying to get them back to their owner. So please keep your ears out and let us know. Good morning. I just had somebody accost me in my parking lot and asked me if I had seen her earring she dropped, so everybody seems to have dropsy, I guess. It's difficult when you've lost something you're not quite sure where you've lost it. It's very hard to reach out to people. Okay, we've got our announcements um, of the life and work, and most of them are in your insert, and I will remind you of each of them. So we have a safety at home presentation on September the 28th, and I believe that's a Wednesday at 10 in St. Paul's Church. Do we know, is that downstairs or upstairs? It's gonna be downstairs. It'll be downstairs, okay. That's being presented by the VUN, and that's a very, uh, they're very helpful for people who want to stay in their homes longer but need assistance, and so they'll be offering a lot of uh, options that you might consider. Okay, the fall dessert party, Luther Bridge and Five Crowns is on Friday, October the 7th. We're into October on our announcements already. Woo. October the 7th here at United Church, and that's desserts and beverages. The tickets are $10 a person, and it's good if you have a table of four, okay? And you call the office by September the 30th. Now, the office is going to be closed from September the 12th to September the 19th, so keep that in mind when you're reading these things to tell you to get in touch with the office. You can't do that from the 12th to the 19th. Now, the, United, the UCW ladies will hold their first meeting of the fall season on September the 20th at 2 p.m. in the Martin Weber room. And everybody is welcome to come to that. I guess every woman is welcome to come to that. Just saying. <laughs> and now, a little more seriously, we have our congregational meeting Sunday the September the 18th following worship. And this is serious. It is imperative that as many members of, as possible attend this meeting because we're going to be making some important decisions regarding the financial future here at St. Paul's United Church. We're all very aware that recent inflation crisis across, uh, on rates on many goods and services have led to an economic crisis across the country. And while we're not alone in feeling the pressure, this does mean that we must look at ways we can respond accordingly and swiftly. At this meeting, we'll be discussing and voting on two proposals that the United Church Board has, believes will help in keeping our congregation financially viable. Now, we had handouts last week with those two proposals on. Do we have copies? We have more today. We have. Today. We have okay, so that if you weren't here last week and didn't see those proposals, they are available in the handout. <clears throat> I wanted to ask, um, and maybe you could tell me, Wayne. I have been speaking to several families who are members of the congregation, and you know how September is coming around from, from August, and, and they're not going to be able to be here because they're at a cottage or, or participating in an event that was already planned, and they wanted to know if they can express their opinion ahead of the meeting in some way, although they wouldn't be able to add to the quorum. I can answer that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm encouraging for folks who were not able to be here on the 18th, please email or call myself or Wayne and let us know any questions or concerns, things that you would like to make sure everybody is aware of and work on. Um, 
we're happy to discuss those beforehand. Even if they can't be part of the vote, we want to make sure all voices are heard. So, yep, absolutely beforehand. Great. Yep. Good. That's a good one to know. Pass on to your families and friends if you know that they would like to be given credit. Okay, and starting this fall, 2022, of course, we'll be using the book Alphabet of Faith by Sarah Jewell to guide our worship and as a book study for the coming year. If you would like to purchase a copy of this book, it can be found in both print and ebook Kindle formats. And we have this lovely line. <laughs> oh, it's only one of this, but I forget. <laughs> if, you, if you have to type it in, you have to type it in perfectly. But if you don't bother, if you just put woodlakebooks.com, it'll jump up and you'll be able to click on it. You don't have to go through that whole thing. <laughs> in, in your, yeah. I, I was I was told that HTTPS at the beginning means have to type perfectly, and then the S is an exclamation when you do it, type it in perfectly. <laughs> so I never get them perfect. Okay, so in any case, you can get a hold of one of those copies of the book for the for the worship guidance and for the uh, book study. Now, somebody has requested, and it has been requested by whatever, that we have 250 milliliter jars for gel. Now, that's not a quart, that's a, that's a half quart, like a pint of sealer. And if you have any of those that people have given you jam, or you have purchased jam, or in the past, and you just washed them and kept them because you hate to throw them out, this would be a good place to put them, and that would be at 30 Jane Street on the front porch, or here at the church office. And those are our announcements, except has anybody got any family announcements, celebration? Has anybody got new people in the school that have gone to a different school? Uh, people who are in your family who have celebrated anniversaries? Let's have some community celebrations. Anybody got anything going on? Come on, you've got to have something going on. I have, what, four? four? Uh, great grandchildren have all gone to kindergarten this year, so I keep getting pictures of, them, of these kids with first day in kindergarten pictures with the little knobbies and big feet, and they look so happy. Has anybody else got people that have gone into a different school or uh, into university? You've got one gone to university, right? Yeah, I've gone to university. Anybody else? My name is David, started kindergarten. In the kindergarten. It's kind of a big step. Oh, wow. Uh, oh. Heart. Her favorite. <laughs> well, there you go. Any more? All right, well that's it. So we are now going to do our uh, at distance peace of Christ. And if you would raise and wave at everybody and wave at Megan up the back and, and, peace, and now for peace of Christ to the members of the congregation. Peace of Christ, everybody. Peace of Christ. <laughs> to make um, regarding masks. So we haven't changed our policy just yet. We are going to be reviewing that over the next couple of weeks with the church board. Uh, we're leaving it up to people's discretion at the moment because we know the world has kind of changed around us and we haven't necessarily updated our policy here. So we're continuing to um, encourage but not enforce any mask uh, mask wearing policy, so just uh, as people are comfortable, and if there's questions, concerns, please don't hesitate to bring those to myself, to Wayne or chair of the board, or Marilyn is also on our reopen task committee, and we'll uh, be happy to address any concerns, any uh, things that people have around that. But we're just, uh, as you're noticing, we still have signs up, we haven't necessarily changed signs, and so uh, like most of the uh, Places that we know we're kind of waiting to see what happens with school and what's going on with the world. And as we settle into that in a new, uh, our third fall of the pandemic, <laughs> we're just waiting to see where things are at before we make any firm decisions about uh, changing things up around here. So I think that's all of our announcements. Did I miss anything? I always look, I forget to look over at Alan sometimes. Did I miss anything, Alan? Got it all. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let us. Please join in our call to worship in song, and I'm going to try and sing it right this week by looking in the handbook. <laughs> I'll invite you to rise in body or spirit as you're able. We'll sing together three times, rise up, rise up, number 130 in more voices.
one who came into it to bring light, to bring love, to bring hope and peace and justice and all that he said and he did. And so may this small flame remind us of that light and that love.
nonetheless, because as I was looking around and cleaning up my office this week, I actually realized some memories from my childhood. The Berenstain Bears had been left behind. And it seemed apt as we think about our first word in the book that we're going to be studying this year, acceptance. And this book about the golden rule, one of the very first things I remember learning in church and at school. So I want to talk about the golden rule today. We're going to move out a little closer here. And I don't know about any of you with your children or yourselves, um, this was really... This family was formative in my faith formation as well as just in my life when I was a child. And so Stan and Jan say, When Sister Bear received a golden locket for her birthday, she was surprised and pleased. It was shaped like a heart and it had her name on it. Happy birthday, dear, said Mama and Papa, giving her a big hug. Sister tried the locket on and she looked at herself in the mirror. I love it. I'm going to wear it all the time. It opens up, said Papa, look. And he showed her how the little clasps opened, and she said, neat. And she looked inside, expecting to find a little picture or a mirror, as you would normally would in a locket. But instead, there was a few simple words written inside. Do to others what you would have them do to you. She was puzzled. The words seemed familiar, but she wasn't sure why. What's this? Well, it's the golden rules. What's that? Well, it's here. It's one of the most important rules of all. That's why we have it always hanging up on the wall of our living room. We did in my household as well. I think it was in that same cross stitch, as a matter of fact. Sister gazed up at it in amazement. She had seen the sampler every day of her life, but no wonder the words seemed familiar. Oh, she said a little embarrassed. I never really thought about it before. What does it mean? The golden rule, Papa said, tells you to treat others the way you would like to be treated yourself. So why is it inside my locket? It's a golden rule inside a golden locket for a little golden princess, Papa said. Well, Mama explained, it's a little more than that. It's called the golden rule because it's precious, just like gold. And it's not about the gold you wear around your neck or on your finger, she said, pointing to her wedding ring. It's about the golden treasure we keep inside our own hearts, and the heart shape of the locket is meant to remind you of that. Sister thought it over, and she didn't really get it, but that was okay, because she loved her new mouth locket anyway. Off she went to school the next day, showing off her new treasure to all her friends, Lizzie, Millie, Anna, and Linda. And they oohed and awed over it in a very satisfying way. I imagine all of our young ones going back to school, showing off their things they gathered over the summer in their first day of school, I bet. What's all the fuss about, said a voice. It was Queenie McBear and her gang. And Queenie was older than Sister and a little sweetie. And when Queenie first came to the neighborhood, she and Sister did not get along at all. But that's because Queenie made fun of her and got Sister's friends to join in. It was her first experience with an in-crowd, a group that makes itself feel big by making others feel small. Oh, hi, Queenie. I was just showing the kids my new locket. Now, over the years, the two of them had learned to get along, and while they were never quite best friends, they tolerated one another. Let's see, said Queenie, and she looked over the locket. She was not impressed. She herself had big gold hoop earrings. Cute she walked away. Queenie still had her own in crowd, and they were a group of older girls who liked hanging out together and acting cool, and mostly they spent their time painting nails and giggling about wolves. And that was okay with Sister Bear. She had her own group of friends to hang out with. It never occurred to her that this might be any kind of problem until a new person came to school. Her name was Susie McGrizzy. Funny name of sorts. For one thing, it had a lot of sense in it. And the new girl herself had a little funny way about her, too. Her clothes weren't exactly cool, and she wore her hair up in pigtails. Nobody did that at the country fair school. And besides, she had thick glasses and braces, and not the cool kind with lots of different colors like Millie, just plain old braces. On her first day, of course, the new girl didn't know anyone at all, and at recess, sister noticed her standing off by herself in the corner of the playground, 
she looked sort of sad and lonely. She was thinking about going over to introduce herself when Lizzie and Anna came up. We're getting together a game of hopscotch, sister. Millie, Linda, they're over there. Come on. Sister began to follow them, but she paused and glanced back to where the new girl was standing all by herself, looking lonelier than ever. Wait a minute, what about the new girl? What's her name? The one over there. Maybe we should invite her to join us. She looks pretty lost and lonely. The other girls were surprised. Susie Woozy Face? She has weird clothes and crazy pigtails. Not to mention clunky glasses and braces. You think that this has changed in this day and age, but I know from hearing from my nieces and my own godson, this still happens in this day and age. So this is a good reminder for us all. Well, sister said discouraged, I just thought, oh, don't worry about old Susie McWoozy. She'll be fine. She'll find some other cubs to play with. Other cubs who are more her type. Let's go. Sister allowed herself to be led away to the hopscotch game. She felt a little worried, though, about Susie McWoozy, although she couldn't say exactly why. But she soon forgot all about it because she was having fun playing hopscotch with her friends. Later, when school let out, sister got in line for the school bus, and she noticed this new girl standing right in front of her. She was going to say hi, but then Lizzie came up behind her, and they started to talk, and they got talking, and went on the bus, still talking. And Susie McGrizzy sat right behind them. Sister went right on talking to, with Lizzie, and sister played with her new locket as she talked, twirling it round and round in the air. And when the bus came to a stop, sis sister gathered up all of her things to get off. But she felt a soft tug on her arm as she did. It was Susie McGrizzy, and she was holding something out to sister. Here, she said shyly, you, you dropped this. It was, in fact, her locket. Gee, thanks, it was all she could think of to say as she jumped off the bus and watched it pull away. She could see Susie looking back and hung, and sis, as sister hung her locket around the neck, she wondered if Susie hadn't noticed, what if Susie hadn't noticed her drop it? It might have been gone for good. How's school today, said Mama as, as sister came in the door. Okay, I guess. She glanced up at the framed sampler of the golden rule over the mantel and somehow the golden locket hanging around her neck started to feel a little bit heavier. That evening at dinner, she was unusually thoughtful and she picked at her lima beans and stared off into space. I think most kids pick at their lima beans and stare off into space. <laughs> a penny for your thoughts, said Papa as he fed Honey Bear. Oh, I was just thinking about the golden rule inside my locket. I don't really get it. What is it supposed to mean? Well, let me give you an example. Do you remember that trouble you had when Queenie first moved to town? She remembered it very, very well. Do you remember how Queenie started an in crowd that kept you out and made fun of your clothes and hair bow? And do you remember how badly you felt? Well, sister certainly remembered that. All the golden rule is saying is that you shouldn't turn around and do that same sort of thing to someone else. He paused to scrape mashed potatoes off on his chin, and you should always treat other people the way you wanted to be treated yourself. But I would never do anything like that. Besides, she said, I don't have any crowd. Oh no, said brother, who'd been taking all this in. What about Lizzie and Anna and Millie and Linda? You play with them all the time, but I never see you asking anyone else to join you. Well, that's different, said sister. I'm just playing with my friends. We're not trying to keep anybody out. Of course not. I'm sure you and your friends would never dream of keeping other cubs out of your group. Sister Bear grew very quiet as she thought about the day at school, and she was not so sure. The picture, if you can't see it from far away, is of the poor new girl standing off as they all went off to play together. The next day at school, as soon as sister Outside, she looked around the playground for Susie McGrizzy, and she spotted her sitting off by herself under the tree reading a book. Sister marched right up to her and said, Hi, Susie. Hello. I'm Sister Bear, and my friends and I are going to play hopscotch. Would you like to join us? Oh, I'd love to, Susie's face lit up. I love hopscotch. Terrific. Do you want to see my locket? Sure. All right, come on, I'll show you. Over there. 
Sister took off Susie chased her, laughing across the playground, where Lizzie, Millie, Anna, and Linda were waiting. And Sister's golden locket gleamed in the sun as she ran. I love that the end of this book, I think it's a book meant for Sunday school, it has activities and questions from Brother and Sister Bear. So you know I like to give homework, so I'm going to leave you with some questions this week. When has someone treated you in a way you didn't like? When has some, have you treated someone in a way that wasn't very kind or fair? And if you want to get out a construction piece of paper and make a big heart on it and go for it and do an activity, you're welcome to this week. But I just love these little reminders. I always am reminded now when I'm reading these stories to little ones about how important it is to remember the lessons that we were taught as children that continue to remain with us throughout our lives. And so we lift that up today and we're going to sing together. We can remain seated as we sing a hymn of response deep in our hearts. It's in Four Voices, number 150. of the earth, 
In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast the sum of them! I try to count them, they are more than the sand. I come to the end, I am still with you. And the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 7, 1 to 5, is a short verse about judgment might be familiar to you. It's similar to the golden rule that we had of do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and it starts like this, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are strength and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the word of the day is acceptance, but before we get to that word, we're going to look at what it says in the scripture. It's all about judgment. Have you ever heard or used the phrase, don't judge me? I use it pretty regularly. I kind of use it in a flippant way sometimes. Or don't be so judgmental. Only God can judge me. I've heard that one many times as well. You know, in general, our wider society doesn't really follow the scriptures these days. We're becoming smaller and smaller, a group who follow these words. But people still love this particular verse. I don't know if you've noticed it as much as I have, but I still hear it all the time. In TV shows, in movies, I see it in social media posts, and especially in comment sections. Don't judge me. And I'm sure most of the time people don't bother putting two and two together, that they're quoting Jesus when they say these words. Do not judge so that you may not be judged, has often been used with the older language of the King James Bible translation. Judge ye not, lest ye be judged. That's one I think I remember on a cross, stitching in the hanging in my grand's house. And I have found over the years that generally when people use this, it's used to defend actions or words, and it gets used as some sort of immunity against doing whatever, to do whatever one wants, because after all, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. And while on the surface it appears to be what the message of Jesus is today, it's not really getting to the heart of what we just heard, I don't believe. I don't believe Jesus is really giving you and I and everyone else in the world license to do whatever we want judgment-free. Clearly not, because Jesus was rarely gentle with his words when he was speaking with the Pharisees, which is what he's doing today. And he would call them names, too. He called them blind guides and whitewashed tombs in this very same gospel. Those sound kind of insulting, pretty judgmental, those words to me. Interpreting the scriptures is a huge task, and we know that over the years we haven't always gotten it right, and that sometimes we need to re-examine things, assumptions, ways that we've learned the scriptures and what they mean to us, and perhaps transform them into a new way of thinking. Too often the words of Jesus get twisted to suit people's agendas and ways of thinking, and often it's in negative ways. But at the heart of Jesus' life and ministry lay the greatest commandments that we know so well, to love God with all of our heart and our mind and our soul, and the second like it, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And as we dive into this new book study this year, The Alphabet of Faith, I can be quoting its author, Sarah Jewell, here and there. And the reason that uh, the United Church Minister group that we've been working together with over the last couple of years, the pandemic, thought this book was so wonderful for our congregation is because Sarah Jewell is a United Church lay minister from Nova Scotia, and she wrote this book in response to ways that she was feeling about what was happening in the world during the pandemic. And so I think it's quite topical for us. We thought that her words were, spoke so clearly to us about the time and place that we find ourselves in. And the first book 
The first chapter of this book begins, when I watched and read the news of, when I watch and read the news of my community and of this country and the United States and the rest of the world, I try to remember to ask, where is Jesus in this scenario? And then I wonder what Jesus would think about what's happening, and my third thought is almost always, or should be, what would Jesus want us, or specifically me, to do about it? We know Jesus was Jewish. He was raised and educated in the culture and religious tradition of his time. And the purpose of his ministry was to acknowledge the laws of Moses and then declare them obsolete because his purpose was to create a new set of laws, a new covenant, establish a new kingdom on earth that would be different from any of the kingdoms, particularly Herod's, that had come before and that already existed in the world that Jesus knew. That new kingdom would be based on two simple laws that I've already mentioned before, love God and love one another. This deceptively simple but incredibly challenging set of commandments is one that we continue to come back to over and over again. And in our passage today, Jesus is talking about something similar. He isn't saying we can't judge other people at all, because that would deny what he says elsewhere in the scriptures, what he is referring to is something a little different. Jesus, I believe, in this passage is condemning the general human desire to evaluate people around us harshly and mercilessly. It seems to be human nature to believe that someone is better than someone else. And it's this kind of thinking we know that has led us down very wrong paths in our human history. The kind of thinking that leads one to believe things like, I manage my mind so much better than that person, or my children are so much better behaved than this person's children. If I had that job, I'd do it so much better. I don't know about any of you, but I've noticed this one in particular when I watch hockey games with my family. Everybody always thinks they could coach the Maple Leafs and bring them to the Stanley Cup so much better than the ones who've been doing it for the last how many years. Whenever we give ourselves the judgment seat, everyone else falls short and we come out on top. Why is that though? Because it's empowering to think that we're better than other people. That we've somehow managed to come through a particular situation or think about something better than somebody else or do a better job at something than someone else. This is what Jesus came into the world to try and change and hundreds of years later, almost thousands of years later really, we're still working on it and that's okay. We're focusing this coming year on this book and we start out with the word acceptance today and it's a word for me that embodies who Jesus was. And it seems to me that people who claim to follow Christ but judge others as less than and don't accept them for who they are still have some work to do. To be fair, Jesus isn't condemning judgment outright. We know that he has judgment in other places. He's condemning the critical, the harsh, the merciless evaluation of others that seems to be so prevalent to him amongst the people of his day. And he's speaking to people in our day, too. He knew this was a human condition and not one that was going to change overnight, and so it continues to speak to us here and now. All these years later, we're still at it. We're still working at the judgment piece. Not saying that we should never judge, but condemning the manner in which we judge and evaluate others is at the heart of his message. If history teaches us anything, it's that the level of criticism <coughs> judgmentalism and harshness a person meets out will be matched by those who are around them. Maybe not always to their face, but often behind their back. And the more critical we are, the more open to criticism we become. And the harder we are on others around us, the harder people are on us too. Really at the heart of criticism and judgment is finding faults of other people and exposing them. And I've watched as some people seem to get some kind of pleasure out of discovering vices and issues for other people. He's such an angry person. She's making all the wrong choices. Those are the worst parents I've ever seen. We all do it at one time or another. We judge somebody else based on our own ways of thinking and how we would do things. I'm admitting and confessing that I've done this before myself. It is human nature. We all do it at times. 
It's the exposing of faults and the harshness of criticism that Jesus is condemning today. Inevitably, we evaluate those around us too harshly, but then somehow manage to graciously judge ourselves in the process. And I've heard this described as a coping mechanism. We truly believe we can explain our own faults away. Now I'm going back to my days as a psychology major in university. We explain away our own faults while looking at everybody else's, thinking they're doing it wrong, I've got it all right, and I have reasons why I'm doing things the way I'm doing them. My childhood, my job, the stress I'm under, my relationships. But the other person over there doesn't have any excuse for behaving the way that they do. We really want to believe we're better than those around us and fault. And fault finding, judgment, and criticism are tools that we use to convince ourselves that we're right. I know I've actually been in this situation before. Here's real confession time. I've gotten off on the wrong foot with someone and prematurely determined that I didn't like them, only later to find out they're not such a bad person after all. We always talk about first impressions being the most important. I actually think second impressions can be just as important. You know, it's the plot of so many movies and TV shows. In the movie Toy Story, I hope everybody's seen Toy Story and I'm not gonna ruin the plot of the movie for you, but I'm just gonna give you a brief synopsis. We have Woody, the cowboy toy, the favorite of his owner, Andy, who is replaced one birthday by the amazing new spaceman toy, Buzz Lightyear. And Woody's resentment of his replacement and Buzz, Buzz, Buzz Lightyear's delusional insistence that he's a real spaceman make these two not see eye to eye. And much of the movie is the two of them fighting against one another until they are forced together unexpectedly. And when they help each other, they realize their individual value as beloved toys for their owner, Little Andy. Such a good movie. Watch it if you have some time this week. Our criticism will often rush us into conclusions. We determine we don't like someone or something before we even try it or get to know somebody based on clothes they wear, political views they have, religious beliefs, socioeconomic status. These are all ways that we can judge somebody before we even get a chance to let them open their mouths and talk to them. It's not fair and it's not gracious, but we do it at times. If we look hard enough into the life of anyone, we'll find their faults, their struggles, and their issues, including if we look hard enough at ourselves. So the question we are needing to ask ourselves is, do we evaluate people from a position of self-righteousness or humility? Humility is where we're called to be. I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit this morning about the loss People around the world are feeling of Queen Elizabeth II this week. She was a gracious world leader, and it came to my mind how much time she spent in the public eye, most definitely receiving judgment for her decisions, for the words that she spoke, for the ways that she interacted with the world, often harshly criticized and condemned if people didn't like things that she said and did. And I don't know about any of you, but I've been really uh, called to rewatch the Netflix series The Crown. <laughs> Highly recommend if you get a chance for that one too. It's just wonderful to look at the evolution of this human being, a single person who affected so many things around the world in over 70 years as queen and 96 years in the public eye. Her entire life from birth to death has been publicly Scene. One of the things that I've appreciated most as I've learned of Queen Elizabeth over the years is that she was a woman of deep Christian faith. And she often used her faith to guide her decisions. She knew she was someone who made mistakes along the way and she made judgments, but she also learned from those mistakes. And I believe had transformational experiences that helped her to grow into the role as queen throughout her 96 years. I believe, to me, she seemed like a woman willing to learn and evolve in her thinking, something she proved many times over in the ways that she shifted 
tradition of the royal family, starting with herself and then her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I was reading through an article this week quoting some of her most memorable speeches over the years, and two that stuck out for me, she always did her Christmas broadcast. And there was one from 2011 and 2002 that stuck out for me as I was reading them. And they went well with our message for today. In 2011, she said, although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that we sometimes need saving from ourselves, from our recklessness or our greed. And in 2002, she said, our modern world places such heavy demands on our time and attention that the need to remember our responsibilities to others is greater than ever. Each day is a new beginning. And I know that the only way to live my life is to try to do what's right, to take the long view, to give my best in all the days, that, in all that the day brings, and to put my trust in God. I know that we all want to be, all want to be treated with dignity and respect. And if we want that for ourselves, we need to treat others the way we want to be treated, the golden rule just like the very same bears reminded us. The lesson we probably learned so well as kids but can forget as we grow older. And the example we learned from Christ himself teaches us to be respectful, to treat people with dignity and accept them for who they are. We know Jesus didn't always get it right. It's one of the things I love most about following Jesus is that he too had moments of fault and was not a perfect human being every moment of his life, but he did learn and it was always trying to do better and be better. I think that's the same as Queen Elizabeth did throughout her time as the sovereign, sovereign leader of the Commonwealth, and the same thing that we are all called to do each and every day. We may not be world leaders, but we all have our common connection as part of this world, as our human selves. Acceptance. Our word of the day is the thing that happens when we follow golden rules and great commandments. And transformation is the thing that happens when we observe the lives around us and accept people as they are, when we release the ignorance, the fear, and the judgment that we hold on to. Acceptance is empowerment for every person, no matter who they are. And it's through acceptance, the radical, arms wide open kind of acceptance that Jesus had and that asked us to have, that we too are empowered to transform the world. And so may we go forward this week to do so, remembering all the lessons from our childhood to now and our faith, and we can say thanks be to God for all this. And our musical response is More Voices number 62. We'll sing this through two times.
Your generosity supports leaders to transform their communities. In 2019, 135 million people faced acute food insecurity. And that sounds like a pre word way of saying starvation. Acute food insecurity. In 2022, the number of people who don't have enough food to meet their basic needs has soared to 345 million. The United Nations calls 2022 a year of unprecedented hunger. One of the ways your mission and service gifts are working to address hunger is by supporting agricultural training centers like the Asian Rural Institute based in Japan. And earlier this summer, 32 community leaders from around the world arrived there to study. Some enrolled to solve problems like raising livestock, others to cope with climate change, and still others to find a market for organic produce. For many, it is their first time traveling outside their countries or even their communities. For them, simply sharing life with people from diverse backgrounds and experiences is filled with immense learning. Marita and Esther are two of these participants. Both women work for a global organization called Conference of Evangelical Churches of Guatemala, where they teach agriculture and support children's education in church and schools. Shortly after United Church staff referred the Guatemalan conference to the Asian Institute, the women signed up. In their own words, they described what motivated them to apply. We decided to apply for the program because we wanted to learn more and improve our work. Just as we are learning at Asian Rural Institute, we would like to work together with everyone physically growing vegetables and caring for animals while sharing our knowledge. In our hometowns, vegetables are usually grown in monocultures. However, at Asian Rural Institute, we are growing multiple varieties of vegetables, taking advantage of each vegetable's characteristics. And we look forward to learning more about this during the training. We can improve nutrition in the local market by growing vegetables in multiple varieties. There are many difficulties that the indigenous Mayan people, especially women, face. Poverty is still a significant issue in Guatemala, and there are also problems such as alcoholism and discrimination among ethnic groups. These problems leave many people, especially families with single mothers, in difficult financial and nutritional situations. There are organizations in each region that support these women and their children and we want to work with such organizations to empower women. Your generosity helps provide education and training and supports leaders to transform their communities so that no one goes hungry. Each and every gift matters. Thank you for your generosity. And now we turn to prayers of thanksgiving for generosity to be in this place through our gifts that are offered here of time, talent, and presence. Let us pray. Holy One, we pray your blessing upon the offerings of time, of talent, of treasure, and of presence to St. Paul's United Church that seek to be the hands and feet of Christ in your world. We lift up our prayers now for the community, and in peace we pray this day. We say, God of love, and invite the response, hear our prayer. God of love, hear our prayer. Creator, from your communion of love, your word went forth to create the symphony of life that sings your praise. And by your holy wisdom, the earth was brought forth into a diversity of creatures who praise you in their being. Day after day, night after night, they reveal themselves to us all. And for this we say, God of love, hear our prayer. We know that there are times when we fail to listen to the cries of the poor and the needs of the most vulnerable. 
We also know that you are present in your creation and seek to heal the wounds that are present in this world. That you can be found walking in the garden, opening our eyes to see all the pain and suffering around us and do what we can to be people of hope and peace and justice. Especially this day, we pray for the people of James Smith Cree Nation in Weldon, Saskatchewan, for those who were victims of a tragedy, and for the first responders and other helpers in this community. We pray that you would help us to follow in your footsteps, learning to walk in the garden like you. And we remember now the precious lives lost this week, even as we pray for the end to senseless violence. We remember and love Thomas Burns, Carol Burns, Gregory Burns, Lydia and Lori Burns, Bonnie and Earl Burns, Lana and Christian Head, Wesley Patterson, and Robert Sanderson. Grant healing and compassion to this grieving community. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling with the floods in Pakistan and earthquakes in China. Give us heart to listen for the good news of your promise to renew the face of the earth. Enliven us with the grace to follow the ways of Christ as we learn to walk lightly upon this world. God of love, hear our prayer. Help us to provide refuge to every animal and plant with whom we live. Help us to be attentive to all you have made. And help us to reach out to those we know who are ill at home or in hospital. God of love, hear our prayer. On this day, we also lift up our prayers for those who are grieving. We lift up our prayers and remember those who have died, who are close to this community and to our hearts. Especially this day, we remember Eli Palfrey, Ruth Ball, and Queen Elizabeth. Pray for you would grant your comfort to all who mourn for these losses. God of love, hear our prayer. O Holy One who hears every voice and knows each cry of injustice, the one who is attentive to the suffering of the earth, bring healing to our lives, that we may protect and listen to the world you have created, and reveal to us the ways in which we can hear your voice and the beauty and wonder of that creation all around us each and every prayers we lift up to you, the ones we speak out loud and the ones too deep for words, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'll invite you to rise and body your spirit now as you're able. We're going to sing our closing hymn number 691, No Ancient
God's way will. So whatever this day holds to continue to do to others as we would have them do to us to remember the lessons of our faith wherever we go this day. And wherever we go this day, may we remember the peace, the love, the justice that was the example of Christ Jesus our Lord, the one in whom we follow, in whom we live and move and have our being. As our worship ends, my friends, may our service in Christ's name begin. And as we share the light of the world, are we singing our assurance of faith today? Oh, All right, so we're, <laughs> we're going to be, we, we learned this tune, and the tune for our new creed, the words are going to be up here. The tune for our new creed, if you might remember, this tune was written by Andrew Aitchison for the 2015 General Council. And so we're going to remind ourselves today of our tune, and we're going to be singing our new creed together for the next few. 